Hi, today we will discuss the spectral proper orthogonal decomposition, or as I like to call it, the mother of all Fourier transforms. Before we get into the weeds, this video builds on top of knowledge of two different mathematical concepts. First, the traditional vanilla proper orthogonal decomposition, which is just a generalization of the eigenvalue decomposition. And secondly, the Fourier transform, which I'm leaving links here of references where you can learn them if you need. With that out of the way, let's get started by just thinking about the signal produced by a probe in a fluid that is able to propagate waves. Here, for visualization purposes, I'm using a float that can measure the height of a water wave in a pond, where the pond is being excited by up and down motion of a wave generator. The wave generator in this case is producing an, a complex motion that is not just simply a sinusoidal wave. We can easily plot the signal of the float height over time, which looks like this. So this float is acting as a point sensor of the height of the wave at a fixed location. We can perform measurements over several locations, and I'm obviously biased here as an experimental aerodynamicist, because we can really use all sorts of techniques to get hundreds or even thousands of probes in a flow with techniques such as particle image velocimetry or pressure sensitive paint. So in this toy example, we're going to use all of these quote-unquote float sensors as a source of data to understand spectral POD and what it's able to give us. Okay, so each one of these floats has now its own time series of heights. We can aggregate this time series into a matrix X and perform regular POD on it immediately. And that would be quite insightful already. Where POD falls short, though, is that it doesn't really have any constraints on the basis functions that comprise the time series V matrix. But in many cases, it is a little easier to understand the behaviors of fluidic systems when we assume that the time series basis functions are complex exponential or sinusoidal waves. Let's just experiment with something simpler. Let's say we took the Fourier transform of all the sensors we have in our dataset. Now we have a set of Fourier transform coefficients. Remember though, that each coefficient is complex value. So now that we know that each one of the Fourier components of the signal, we could attempt to isolate the wave spatial distribution for a single frequency by plotting only the real part of the Fourier co component at a fixed frequency, but now over space. So since this plot is really just a set of complex numbers distributed over the spatial variable, that is, the float sensors, we can multiply them by e to the 2 pi ift to see how this wave evolves in time. And this is a rather different perspective on the data, right? Instead of looking at the data set as a set of time series, we take the Fourier transform of all of these time series and look at each one of these frequencies to see the amplitude and phase distribution over space. So now we're going to leverage this perspective on the data to another level by combining this Fourier analysis with a proper orthogonal decomposition. This will allow us to get noise reduction properties and improvements in our statistics by the use of ensemble averaging. Let's talk about the Velch method for power spectrum estimation to understand the utility of ensemble averaging. I'll use the audio of this ducted fan as an example. Now 
Note that there are three distinct phases in this audio clip. First, the fan accelerates to the condition. Then, it spans about 6 seconds in a constant RPM. And finally, it decelerates back to idle. This chart in the screen is a spectrogram or a short time Fourier transform. Each vertical segment of the pixels in this chart is a Fourier transform performed in a small window of about 25 milliseconds. So we can see that the acceleration and deceleration phases of this audio clip have a varying spectrum. The middle section where the fan is at a constant RPM is different. The fan is at a constant condition and the spectrum is mostly unchanging. But if you compare different samples of the spectrogram at different times, you see that there is a difference between the spectra of each sample. In the case of a constant RPM, each one of the spectrogram samples is coming from the same unchanging underlying process. This means that the samples of the spectrogram are different not because the underlying process is actually changing, but simply because we clipped the audio into these 25 millisecond windows to produce each one of the spectral samples. So the Welsh method is a way of estimating the average power in each one of the frequency bins of the spectrum by taking the average power spectrum from all the samples. The more samples we have, the more converged the average power estimate will be, meaning the spectrum will be a more accurate representation of the underlying process that generated the data. If you have a finite record length, then there is a trade-off between the frequency resolution of the average spectrum and the uncertainty of the spectral components. On one extreme, we can take one single sample of the entire audio clip and take its Fourier transform, producing a single sample of the spectrum. The spectrum then looks very noisy, but its frequency resolution is as high as possible. We can split the audio clip into multiple windows, which will reduce the noise of the average spectrum, but will also reduce the frequency resolution as the windows comprise of a shorter record length. This can obviously be taken into the extreme, where we have an extremely certain estimate of only two frequencies, which is not very useful. An optimal point lies in the middle and has to be considered in a case-by-case -case basis. Then. So let's recap what we covered so far. We start with a bunch of time series simultaneously collected from a set of spatially distributed sensors in a field that propagates waves. If we simply take the Fourier transform of each one of these time series, we end up with a set of complex Fourier coefficients for each one of these sensors and for each frequency. Because each coefficient is really a complex number, it encodes the phase relationship between the sensors, which we can visualize by plotting the real part of the sensor coefficient multiplied by e to the pi i theta, where theta is the phase angle that advances the wave in time. This approach is already really powerful to visualize the spatial distribution of waves in data, but it would be really nice if we could use the Welch method, which performs this ensemble averaging operation, to get reduction of spectral uncertainty when we're dealing with real data. If we recall the Welch averaging method that we just discussed, we are averaging the power spectrum, which is really the magnitude of the complex Fourier coefficients, squared. This is a problem now because we are ignoring the phase information, which is what we are seeking when we are analyzing multiple sensors. But if we don't use the magnitude operation, 
then the complex Fourier coefficients would cancel out and average to zero as each window has a different starting phase for a given frequency. And this is where POD comes to help. I'll first go through the spectral POD algorithm for the sake of completeness and in order to make sure that you understand what the spectral POD machinery is actually doing. So let's start with the organization of the data. In our example, we have a 2D grid of sensors that provides a time series of measurements. We need to flatten the sensor's dimension into a single dimension. This will allow us to work with any number of dimensions of sensors. Once we flatten the sensors, then we will have a 2D matrix with dimensions of number of sensors by time. Now we split the matrix into multiple blocks, exactly as you would do in the Velge averaging method. The block size is arbitrary, and the blocks can also have overlapping data. For each one of these blocks, we perform the FFT algorithm. Okay, so we have this 3D data structure with dimensions of sensors by frequencies by blocks. Now comes the fun part. Let's slice this 3D data structure such that we have 2D matrices of sensors by blocks for a given frequency. Remember, all the values in this matrix are complex numbers. The spectral POD consists of taking the proper orthogonal decomposition of each one of these 2D matrices. We end up with a left singular vector matrix U of sensor by modes, a singular value matrix sigma of modes by modes, and a right singular vector matrix V of modes by blocks. We get one of each of these three matrices for each given frequency in the FFT. Okay, so I hope this procedure makes some sense to you. Now I'll do my best to help you understand why the highest energy modes of the spectral POD will pro provide a similar averaging property as the Velch method. Okay, so it took me a while to figure out a way of in explaining in an intuitive way what POD is doing when the data matrix is comprised of complex numbers. It's hard to visualize this because even a simple 2D data set requires four dimensions to plot as a point cloud. So it may make more sense to step back a little bit and look at the simple example of the real value 2D data set. Here we have a point cloud showing the measurements of sensor one versus sensor two over time. The proper orthogonal decomposition will find the unit vector that spans the most variance of this point cloud and then find the second unit vector such that it is orthogonal to the first. In two dimensions, that finishes the algorithm, but in n dimensions, we're going to find n of these mutually orthogonal vectors. Let's say that the data of sensors 1 and 2 are perfectly correlated, such that sensor 2 is just a constant k times sensor 1. Then the first singular vector of POD is obviously going to be the line S2 equals k times S1. And the second singular vector just ends up perpendicular to the first. The first singular vector then encodes this relationship between the two sensors, that is, that the second sensor value is just the first sensor value times some constant. When we come back to the noisy sensor case, then the singular vector is attempting to find this relationship by maximizing the energy captured. This constant k, however, could very well be a complex number when the original data set is complex valued. We can express this as k equals a to the i phi. In other words, if k is complex, then we have an amplitude a and a phase angle phi. So if the two sensors are out of phase by an angle phi, that would also be captured by the singular vector. So now let's come back to our wave example. I'm showing here the phase distribution for a specific frequency from the Fourier transform again, but now I split the Fourier transform into 20 different blocks, according to the Velch method. Let's look at the phase distribution for each block. We can note that the maps look very similar to one another. The color scale bounds are the same, so we're seeing basically a variation in global phase and global amplitude. In other words, we're seeing a multiplication by a constant k equals z to the i phi. When I add the noise to the underlying data, we still see the same maps, 
but now there's noise in the phase angles. But as long as the noise is not overwhelming the signal too much, the spectral POD will be able to extract a singular vector that is representative of this phase relationship. Therefore, the first few most energetic modes in SPOD will extract a singular vector that is most representative of this amplitude phase relationship between the different sensors. The interesting part for fluid mechanics is that this will reveal the wave behavior of the unsteadiness in the flow, which can be quite insightful to understand the physics of complex flow fields, especially when phase maps are accompanied by a power spectrum. Okay, I know this is not much, but I hope this helps you get started on understanding the power of spectral POD to help us understanding complex fluid mechanical systems, and at least it serves as a starting point for the deeper readings in the subject, which I'm going to be honest can be pretty daunting. I'll add some links below for really good papers by the big names in this topic, that is Professor Schmidt, Town, Brunton, Tyra, and many others. And please like and share this video if you think this was a good explanation. Alright, I'll see you in the next one. Bye now.